It's amazing how, um, just as humans, we love, we love to have heroes, don't we? we? We love heroes. The hero usually provides what is needed just in time. The hero is often uh, beaten to an inch of their life, but they bounce back at the right moment to save the day, to, to provide what is, what is needed. So whether it's our heroes um, uh, from, from superheroes, from cartoons, from Marvel, if you're into that kind of thing, or whether it's our political heroes, you might not think any of those are heroes, but I'm sure some people will think some of those are heroes. Uh, I'm not telling you what I think. Um, or maybe it's just the heroes of, of everyday life, which I'm getting some support for at the front. The heroes of everyday uh, life. Now here's the thing, as we get back into Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 42 this morning, it is crystal clear uh, that God's people, to quote Bonnie Tyler, need a hero, desperately. She sung that song, I need a hero. Um, king Cyrus, the, the king of Persia, uh, has ended the ex- exile of God's people in Babylon. God's people have come away, are coming away, um, is the promise from Babylon. But God's people still need a hero because King Cyrus cannot be that hero. King Cyrus cannot bring ultimately what the people need. And what is that? It's a right and proper relationship with God. What God's people needed was lasting, true, and final freedom. Not just from physical exile, but from spiritual exile, away from their God. Now here's the thing, for some of us this morning, we might feel like we're in spiritual exile. We know there is a God, but we don't know Him. We don't feel like we're in relationship with Him. Some of us uh, might be in many spiritual exiles this morning. We do know God, we're, we're securing our relationship with Jesus, but we just feel like this week, this week we've been wandering away far too often from our Saviour Jesus, even though we love Him and trust Him. We need a hero, and Isaiah 42 presents us with the exact kind of hero that we, uh, God's people, need. In fact, not just God's people, but all of the nations, according to Isaiah 42. And the hero is the servant of of the Lord. So there are two things about this hero, the servant of the Lord, that we need to find out. Firstly, who is he? And secondly, what does he do? Who is he and what does he actually do as a hero? So our first question then, uh, who is the hero in verses uh, 1 to, to 3? Now, if you've ever been to or seen on TV a major boxing match, you, you know how often the introduction to the boxers is often over-exaggerated, isn't it? In the red corner, here he is, and he's not that good, but we're going to make him sound greater than he is. But those boxing introductions pale into insignificance when we look at the introduction in verse 1 to the servant of the Lord. Look down with me at verse 1 of Isaiah 42. It says this, Here is my servant, says God, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit upon him. You see, this servant is the chosen one by God, delighted in by God. God's spirit is on him. This is no ordinary servant dressed in rags. But that doesn't, we see that, but that doesn't answer the question, does it? Who is he? Who is the servant? The greatest clue uh, to this question, of course, is found in the Gospels, written hundreds of years after what we read in Isaiah. Let me quote to you this morning from Mark chapter 1. Just listen, you don't have to go there. In Mark chapter 1, we read this. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. But then what do we read? Uh, Just later, a voice speaks, and the voice says, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Does that sound familiar to you? Maybe you've heard those words before, but does what I've read sound familiar? The spirit being upon someone? The servant of God in Isaiah is talking about Jesus. The spirit coming upon him. This is my chosen one in whom I love. I delight in him. Very similar words. The servant of God is talking about Jesus, but maybe you don't believe me yet. Well, let's go on further and see what this servant is like, because there's even more clues about who this servant is. What is he like? Verse 2 and 3. Look with me. He will not shout out or, or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not 
snuff out. Now, heroes, generally, if you've, if you've seen any, tend to make a lot of noise, don't they? They tend to make a lot of noise. When you're saving the day, it's a noisy business, normally. But not this hero. Not this hero at all. The point here, according to Isaiah, is that this servant hero would say nothing. He would say nothing. So again, we, we fast forward to the New Testament and we come to the, the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew shows us what does, what does this mean that this servant would say nothing. He, he quotes these verses in Isaiah just after we read this. Matthew 12, verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. These very words in front of us today. You see what Jesus does there? He doesn't raise his voice, does he? He doesn't shout out against his enemies. But what does he do? What's Matthew's point? He walks away from his enemies. It's what we're all taught at school, to walk away. Jesus does not shout out or cry out. That was not his manner. But it's not because he's soft, and it's not because he's overpowered, but it's because he's got another purpose. He walks away from his enemies, but who does he turn towards? The crowds. And who were they? The crowds of Jesus' day. They were the bruised reeds, weren't they? And the smouldering wicks. The point here is that, that Jesus is the tender hero, isn't he? He's the quiet and tender hero. Jesus came to heal the physically broken, the bruised reeds. But more than that, Jesus came to, he to heal the spiritually broken, to save the spiritually broken through his words of life. That's who he came for, the bruised reeds, the smouldering wicks. Do you ever doubt the character of God? What is God like? Is he really kind? Well, look at the character of Jesus. Tender and loving to all who wanted to come to him in humility and brokenness. He was tender to them. Do you feel this morning that Jesus is for you? Is Jesus the kind of person for you? You see, this servant Jesus would bring a message, an invitation that was good news for all types of people from all nations. His teaching his transforming power and ultimately his triumph would be for all types of people. So we now move on, not just uh, who is this hero, but what does this hero come to do? Our second point in verses 3 to 17. The first thing the hero does then is he brings true teaching for the nations. Look down with me at verses 3 and 4. We read this, In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. And in his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Now this morning, I'd like to give us a tip for reading the Bible. Um, it's quite a simple tip, really. Often we overcomplicate reading the Bible. It's a big book, but we overcomplicate it. Here's my tip. When you see something spoken about more than once, you might want to pay attention to it. Now that's just a tip for life, isn't it? If you hear something emphasised, you might want to look at it and work out what it means. And that's exactly what happens in these verses before us. What is spoken about here lots in Isaiah 42, even in the verses we've read, it's spoken about three times, is the word justice. Did you see that word? Justice. It's there three times. What does this servant come to do? He comes into the world, according to Isaiah, to bring justice to the world. Is that something that grows in you as you get older? I don't know, most of you are older than me. Wanting to see justice done in the world? Is that something that you want more and more as you, as you, as you grow older? I think so. I'm experiencing that. But we're told in Isaiah, Jesus would bring true justice to the world. And we know that Jesus would do this in three key ways. Firstly, Jesus would bring justice into the world as he made clear the things that God said that were right and wrong. That's the first way Jesus would bring justice to the world. The second way Jesus would bring justice, true righteousness to the world, was in the sense that Jesus wouldn't just come once, but he would come again. And the Bible says Jesus would come to bring justice as the judge of the world. 
But the final way that Jesus, the hero servant, would bring justice into the world, and the most wonderful way Jesus would bring justice, was in the sense that he was the one who would come to justify those who deserved the full weight of divine judgment from God. He would ultimately be the one who would bring people into a right relationship with God. That's what justice is about, rightness. He would be the one to do it, to bring final justice. And how would he do it? How did Jesus do it? By taking God's justice for us. God's justice would be done in that our sin against God would be paid for by Jesus himself. We see it in the Gospels, don't we? Jesus says it's finished, it's done. He takes the price as he dies on the cross for us. So if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, he has paid for your sin. And the Bible says, therefore, there is no guilt and no condemnation for the person who who puts their trust truly in him. That is good news. So Jesus came to reveal justice to the world through his teaching. And therefore, in verse 4, do you see how people respond to that? Verse 4, look with me. In his teaching of true justice and righteousness, the way to be right with God, the islands will put their hope. That is the islands. That is to symbolize people all over the world will put their hope in Jesus. So the first question then this morning is, have we ourselves put our hope in the servant hero that is Jesus? Have we put our hope fully and finally in him truly? The second question is, if we have, then what are the implications for our church? And this morning, one implication I want to draw out is that we should give thanks to God for events like last night that Lee has shown us pictures about this morning of the International Food Night. What a wonderful event when the gospel of true righteousness and justice was proclaimed to people. People could hear about Jesus who they can put their hope in. He is the one to bring us from spiritual exile away from God to know God, to be free in knowing God. So don't lose heart if you're a member of Trinity Church this morning. The word on the street is that, is that the gospel is going out in Scarborough. Have you seen it happening? Are you taking part in it? Are you rejoicing in it? It's so good, isn't it? And we're pushing on, we're pushing on, but don't lose heart. The gospel is going out. People are coming to find out a hope that they can have in Jesus. So be encouraged. It's good news. The second thing, though, that the hero will do is not just bring true teaching for the nations, but bring true transformation for the nations in verse 5 to 9. Here's the thing. Anyone who makes big claims needs to be able to back them up. Agreed? Yeah, murmur of agreement, but it's true, isn't it? You need to be able to back them up. Like, for example, if I make this claim, which I think is true, that I am the strongest man in this church, yeah? Pretty obvious, right, surely? Then I need to be able to back it up. I've got to prove it, right? So, too, we've got a big claim this morning about this hero, Jesus, about what he's going to come and do. And we need to know that he can back it up. We need to know that he can back it up, that he can really do it. And the Bible tells us that this hero is himself, According to the Bible, this hero Jesus is himself God. And that should be enough to back up his claim that he is the one to bring hope to the nations. But Isaiah 42 is going to add a little bit of colour to that for us. So look with me at verse 5. This is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Do you hear what God is saying? God's saying, trust me. I'm the one who created the heavens and the earth. So I'm the one who's got the power to bring true everything that I've said. All of my teaching will come true if you put put your trust in it. I'm the one who created the world. Trust me, I have the power. But here's the thing. Uh, We're not just introduced to a God, a servant who has the power, but a God, a servant who will be present as well. He's not just powerful, but he's present, verse 6. Listen to what we read. Uh, God is talking to his servant. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. You see, Jesus will be a covenant for the people. He himself will be the promise. That is Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. Jesus himself is the promise. 
for anyone who believes in him. In him. So with his power and his presence in mind, that this is the, the Jesus who would come in power to his people to be a promise to them, what will he achieve? What will he achieve? Verse 7, look with me. He comes to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. What wonderful words uh, those are. Um, I've been watching recently with uh, my wife Emma something called Burn Notice. You may have seen it. It's a, it's a series on Amazon Prime. And it's about an American spy who's fallen out of favour with the American government and ends up uh, in his position as a, fo- in, as, a, as, a, as a burnt spy trying to solve everybody else's problems. He rescues hostages. He helps people who can't stand up for themselves. He's a great guy. He's the kind of hero who, despite his flaws, you end up liking. And me, personally, I kind of want to be like him a little bit. He's strong and he's clever and he's sharp and all the things that I'm actually not. And so when we see that Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospels, healing the sick, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind, as we read in verse 7, who can help but like the guy? Who can help but like the guy? I don't care what you know about Jesus. When you hear that this is, the, this is Jesus who opens the eyes of the blind, who helps the poor, who heals the lame, who can say he's a bad man? He's a good man, right? Whatever you know about Jesus. Yet here's the thing. This isn't the only thing that, Jesus, uh, that Isaiah sorry, is talking about. Sure, the servant of the Lord did heal the blind. But do you remember him freeing any captives in the Gospels or releasing people from dungeons? Do you remember that bit? He didn't quite come to do that, did he? Isaiah is actually talking about the powerful spiritual transformation that Jesus would bring. So sure, he would heal the blind. But sure, he would do so much more than that. You see, with Jesus' spiritual blindness is turned to spiritual sight as you come to know him. Because as you come to know him, you come to know God. Spiritual captives are released from the prison that is spiritual exile as they come to know Jesus. Spiritual bondage to Satan, sinful desires, and the dungeon of darkness that is our own hearts is broken as we come to know Jesus. And so a famous hymn puts it like this, as we come to know Jesus says this, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Your sunrise turned that night to day. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. Can you believe that in Jesus there is such power for transformation? Don't you want to experience that kind of freedom? Freedom from spiritual exile and darkness to know the God who created the heavens and the earth, who created you and loves you? We've heard this morning from Kylie, who has recently come to know such transformation for herself. Maybe you're here thinking through all of this stuff. It would be so worth your while uh, to come and find out more. Come back, come and ask questions. Your questions are welcome. Come to our Explore course. Uh, that we'll be running shortly. Come and talk to me afterwards about details for that. Come and ask your questions. Find out more. Maybe you've already known such a powerful transformation for yourself. Well, this term in life groups, we're going to be working through uh, four chapters of a short book called Have No Fear. And it's a book that's going to help motivate us and grow us in our skills to share the true teaching and true transforming power of Jesus with others. And we would love you to engage with this book as a church family. And if you're not yet part of a life group, then come and chat to me and you'll, you'll get a book anywhere. Um, but it's a wonderful book to help motivate us as we proclaim the transforming power of the gospel to others. You see, true transformation comes through the true teaching of the true servant hero of the Lord. But it finally leads to true triumph. To true triumph. Verses 10 to 17. Now I wonder this morning, when was the last time when you were ecstatically excited about something? Like ecstatically excited about something. Is it when you're watching sport on TV? Are you the kind of person like me who has to stand up when it gets really exciting and annoy everybody? Is it when you you hear that your friends are going to have a baby? Twins even, for some of us who know about that. Some friends in this church, it's wonderful news. 
You might notice then that verse 10 begins with sudden excitement and song, doesn't it? Verse 10, look with me down. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the ends of the earth. Sing to the Lord a new song. So our question is, who's to sing? Who is singing in verse 10 and 12? It's an interesting question. We could ask it this morning if we looked around. Who's singing? Who's singing really loudly? Who's really singing ecstatically and joyfully? Uh, But it's a much more fascinating question to see who is singing in verse 10 and 12. So let's read it from 10 to 12 together. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them, let the wilderness and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives rejoice. Let the people of Sela sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. Did you see that at the end? Who is encouraged to sing? The islands are encouraged to sing. The wilderness and its towns, the settlements where Kedar lives are to sing. Let the people of Sela sing for joy. See, these are all references to places and people groups outside of the traditional boundaries of Israel, God's people. And did you notice how those people are to sing for joy? Here is a call to joyful singing because of all that we have just heard about. The true teaching that leads to true transformation for all nations. And they sing because ultimately the teaching, the transformation that you know when you come to Jesus will one day lead to triumph. And verse 13 tells us about that triumph. Verse 13, look with me. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. God will triumph over his enemies. Therefore, not only God will triumph, but all who have put their hope in him, in the teaching of God's servant, will also too triumph. Verse 14, for a long time I've kept silent. I've been quiet and held myself back, says God. But now like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. You see, God did not enjoy sending his people Israel into exile, but he loved them. He disciplined them for their constant rebellion. That's why they ended up in Babylon in exile. But now he speaks about a hope that they could not have imagined, not simply being rescued and brought out of physical exile, but a future hope of joy and triumph that is won for them by God through his servant. It is not as though God could not bring his final victory then or even now, but he wants more people to enjoy it when his final triumph comes. So he waits whilst his people spread the message of hope to more people. That's the job of the church, to take that teaching to the islands that they would put their hope in it. But what joy it is, verse 16. What joy, what comfort, what security. Verse 16, I will lead the blind by their ways, by by the ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do and I will not forsake them, ever. But those who trust in idols, you who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. You see, those who put their hope in the servant of the Lord will be guided, will walk in the light, never be forsaken by their God. And yet those who reject the servant of God and turn to idols will find that they will be turned away in shame. That's what the word of God says. In a burning building, no one rejects the everyday hero who comes to save you. But you say, yes, please, I need to be saved. And now that we've met the true hero of the Bible the servant of the Lord, Jesus, who provides what we truly need. Let us make sure that we put our hope truly, finally and fully in him. Let's pray. (coughs) Well, Father, we thank you for answering our prayers and introducing us to the servant, your son, Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners uh, like Uh, like us here, Father. Uh, We thank you that through putting our hope in him, because of all that he did, we can be brought from spiritual exile into a right relationship with him. And we pray that all of our hope, all of our love, uh, would be to him. Um, And Father, we pray that if we haven't yet come to know the hope that is possible in Jesus, future joy and triumph, 
We pray that you would help us to know more of him, to find out who he really is, and ultimately put our trust in him. And we ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen.